to kind of commence uh, now that we're, we're inside the last 50 kilometers. Well, this course, again, definitely won't suit the pure, pure sprinters. That's why I think we're seeing Team Lotto and El Yumbo try and get something from this race. So again, like Lamprey before, as you said, Brian, just forcing the pace a little bit on the climb. It's a short climb of the Avenue du Parc, then it flattens off, briefly drops down, and then kicks up again to the top of the Côte de Camillianoud. So the gap 310, a very hectic feed zone. Brian is going the wrong side on the inside of that feed. We saw that a little bit in the Grand Prix Quebec as well. As we know, feed zones can be very, very hectic, but when riders go the wrong side of the Swanier, it can be very dangerous indeed. But there's the Arrowhead formation with the park on their left-hand side. The Parc Jeanimos swinging left now. Again, Lamprey Marie to now take it up at the front. And we will see them really force this pace, and I've no doubt we'll see the lead tumble by another 30 or 40 seconds because the pace now, Brian, will be increasingly, well, increasingly harder, lap by lap. The climbers now making sure they're up near the front. There you go, just saw Peter Sagan there using the pavement. A little deft bunny hop to move himself back up again. Well, you can tell as soon as Lamprey came to it, they didn't in the previous lap. Saw Sam Bennett uh, looking for movement as, as he went up towards the front, thinking of uh, sliding space. We've already uh, said that, but it's probably not the race for him. He'll try his best. Doesn't mind going up, uh, you know, climbs like this, but I think. As soon as uh, Lamprey start to really push and the race is on, there's a few teams want to get involved. Sean Deby was in the breakaway of six. He's now about to be caught. So the card of uh, Lotto Sadal putting a rider on the breakaway so they don't have to do any work. He's now been caught. Lamprey pushed into the bottom of this climb. And now Lotto uh, NL Yumbo are just keeping the tempo high. I think the effort of that Lamprey ride has almost come to a grinding halt. He talked about reversing. He's got his reversing lights on there without a doubt. And again, you do see rods often do that when they know they're near the end of what they've got to give. They often see them go to the front, make one final effort before swinging off. And it's actually Moreno Hofland on the front now, the former Netherlands champion. A sprinter have been put to use on this climb, but sprinters can can climb well when they need to. And he's because they know that their finish line is just a couple of k's down the road. He's one of these riders that can go over the climb, so obviously not got the right form. And, and Wilco Kelderman has, has got a bit better form, and this really kind of suits him, uh, this type of race. So uh, Moreno Hoffland being used up at the moment uh, to try and uh, kind of string out the peloton. And as we see at the back of the peloton, some riders starting to be dropped. I think another rider, what we're talking about, Team Lotto and El Yumbo. Mike Turnison is another young rider to watch out for, as we see. Magic Modern Bodnar, I don't know whether he's coming back on or actually been dropped. It looks like he was still full of fight there. Still Lotto and Oyumbo on the front. Sam Uman in the center there for uh, Giant Alperson. You can just see on the left-hand side, Diego Ulissi. I think he's got to be one of the favorites for this race. He was seventh on Friday, but this parkour will suit him a little bit more. But meanwhile, up in front, Benjamin Perry takes the points on the top of the climb to add some more points to his tally. I think it has been Perry been taking the vast majority of the points so three more points in the bag for him slight acceleration to ensure he went over the top in first place and now Geraint Thomas of Team Sky and just look at this this is a real determined effort to really try and string things out now Brian yes yeah, really starting the uh, previous lap it was Lamprey and nobody really wanted to take it on but uh, they tried again to put one rider at the bottom of the climb he swung off very quickly this is what they're trying to do they're trying to create uh, a race they're trying to uh, have other riders get involved with the race and uh, it certainly seems to be happening now with Geraint Thomas putting in an effort now we got uh, looks like Ofredo coming to the front for uh, Francais de Jeu so the, looking behind still a long way to go uh, just under 45 minutes but the race has definitely started it certainly is I saw Michael Albacini also there for Orica Bike Exchange the Swiss rider goes very well on this sort of terrain and one rider in a little bit of difficulty is Albert Timmer just at the back. And there's an attack from one of the riders from Yam at Cycling, just going clear. He's drawn another one rider from BMC. It's actually the Swiss road champion. A little bit of a look over his shoulder. Jonathan Fumio. And then Mobistar also getting in the mix. But a big split is occurring here, Brian. One or two riders trying to get across this gap. Several riders from Aston are also there in the light blue. As we said, still with four laps to go. Three more ascents after this of this climb. Riders really starting to get stuck in. That's Manuel Seni on the right-hand side for BMC. 
Well, I just want to make sure they're at the front, not doing too much. Just saw the Olympic road champion there, Greg Van Avmaet, who was second to Peter Sagan on Friday in the GP Quebec. That's Chris Juliensen now on the front for Orica Bike Exchange. Grimacing is the rider with dual Irish and Danish nationality. Great signing, I think. A real good rider. Very, very aggressive indeed. Look at these attacks. These are really going to start to sting now. Yeah, you can just see uh, a group about uh, almost uh, 20 riders, some other riders trying to come across. So the race is definitely starting. Uh, they, they're not worried too much about the uh, the riders down the road. They are coming back just naturally as the race starts. But uh, over the top of that climb, Chris Yule Jensen at the front for uh, Orica Bike Exchange, stringing things out. It really all depends on who is in this group, whether they push on or not. But it's uh, definitely... Uh, full gas on that climb this time. Well, that really has opened things up. There's a little group just in the middle, and it looks like uh, Rafa and Mike are just trying to go across the gap there. And a very late surge there from uh, one of the riders from Cannondale. Did look like Rigoberto around, and meanwhile, the rest of the field really strong out there, fighting for position just over the top of this climb. And unsurprisingly, that flurry of activity on the climb of the Code de Camilla Nudes uh, slashed the lead to 2 minutes and 45 seconds. But still, in a smooth workmanlike manner, this group still continued to work together. They're over the top of the climb, the Code de la Polytechnique now, and they're dropping down towards the Avenue du Parc once more. And these laps now, Brian, are really starting to tick by. Uh, they are. Uh, the breakaway, uh, Cyril Gautier, is up towards the front as well. But uh, the breakaway, having two Neo pros and two riders from the Canadian national team, they've equipped themselves well, but uh, the gap coming down very quickly. We knew that would happen because this race is over 205.7 kilometres. So it's going to kick in, the tiredness. And, uh, you know, these attacks are going to keep on coming. And it's... It's going to start biting as we get closer to this final lap. And it's like Gregory Rast. Or, no, it's not uh, Gregory Rast. It's, uh, I think, one of the classic specialists. It's like Jesper Stoyven on the front now, Brian, for uh, Trek Factory. Oh, sorry, Trek Segafredo. To uh, coin their correct name, getting into that aero tuck, just dropping down the descent of the Côte de Camillianud. And a big group of around 25 or 30 riders now pulling clear. A dangerous move. And it's 2 minutes and 25 for our leaders. So our four riders left out in front. Lucas Postelberger of Borda Argon, 18, and Austria, 24 years of age. He's the man in the black and red sat on the back of the group. There are two Canadians there, Ben Perry and Matteo Dalsin, both of the Canadian national squad. And Fabien Grelier is also there, the young Frenchman for Direct Energie. And this is what has happened on the climb of the Côte Gamilian Oud. The bunch have effectively sat up, although there are one or two riders desperate to try and get back on terms. But that, Brian, is a really significant split. Looking at the colour blocking in that team, well, in that break, or that split, it looks like most of the big World Tour teams are actually represented, and that's why the bunch has just eased off a little bit. It has done. Uh, I'd really like to see who's in this move. It did look as if uh, BMC will want to push on by their uh, young rider, Senny. Um, not too sure who else wants to push on. Normally when you get these attacks and you get a group, there are a lot of looking around. Uh, you know, once that information gets back to the uh, the team cars, they'll make the call whether to push on or not. But a little indecision at the moment. That's why we're not getting a lot of cohesion. But, you know, looking at it now, Astana really want to, uh, to keep on riding. This looks like... Um, uh, Phil Sang uh, is riding at the front. Lamprey are happy with this as well. Uh, Aru is uh, in this uh, front group. So there's a few teams happy with it, a few teams not happy with it. And uh, it's obviously too big a group uh, to keep uh, you know, cohesion, but it's definitely grown a little bit to closer to 30 riders. And it was uh, Jakob Phil Sang, silver medalist in the Olympic Games in Rio. We've actually got the first three riders. The three medalists of Rio here, of course, Greg Van Avermaet, riding on his new golden BMC bike. He is the Olympic champion for BMC. And we've also got the bronze medalists here in the form of Rafa Maika of Tinkoff. And I think he did infiltrate this, this move. Just have a look back through. Lighting making it a little bit difficult to see exactly who is here. Looks like Paul Voss is there, actually, for Bora Argon 18. And that is Greg Van Avermaet just at the back of the group. No, it's not Greg Van Avermaet, in fact. That is uh, Damiano Caruso, the Italian, very, very good climber. And meanwhile, the gap to our four leaders continues to tumble as they drop back down towards the Avenue de Parc and up the finishing straight once more. 
is still continuing to work very well. But it does appear, Brian, that there is quite a lot of cohesion in that group. All of the major teams seemingly willing to try and work. But it looks like the Canadian rider on the back may have a little bit of a punch up. You see riders hopping up and down the back wheel just to check the pressure in the tyre. And that's a bit unfortunate if that were to be the case. I reckon there's quite a few teams not happy with the, this group. Um, we've seen that uh, Gerang Thomas is uh, definitely in here. So um, Sam Uman, I think uh, Naevi is uh, also in there for uh, Team Sky. But only two riders. Seems uh, the team that's really interested in, in this is, in fact, the team of uh, Astana. So they're the ones pushing on with uh, three riders from uh, Lamprey as well. They're the ones that started to instigate it in the previous lap, but still a lot of riders towards the back of this group not happy uh, and helping. I don't. I can only see one rider from um, uh, Lotto Sudal towards the back, one rider from uh, Etix Quickstep as well, only one rider from uh, Lotto NL Yumbo, one rider from Cannondale. So there's, there's a lot of individual riders, and, you know, to, to go forward with this... I think they're, they're, they're just interested in being here uh, and not uh, contributing too much to the uh, pace at the front of the peloton. And as you say, Brian, there's three from Aston there. They've uh, really done well to get three in this move. And I said three from Lamprey, and that's why we saw those teams willing to move. But with Sky having only one rider in there as well, in the form of Geraint Thomas, he won't work too hard at all on the front. And you can just see how active the bunch is behind in trying to neutralize this move. It is very, very dangerous, but I don't think the composition if, of that move is what most teams are particularly happy with. And the gap now, one minute and 58 seconds. And the three Astana riders lead the chase down this very technical part of the circuit. Thankfully, the conditions this year are completely dry, as I mentioned at the top of the program. In stark contrast to the horrific conditions we had last year, just hovering above freezing, pouring rain and wind. But they really are pressing on here. Of course, this is eating into the lead of our four escapees. Will we see the bunch around that corner? Because this is starting to open up a little bit. I don't think it's quite panic stations. And it's a uh, tink off uh, one rider on the front uh, trying to, to bring this back. They realise the danger. And, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're looking at bringing this all back uh, for uh, Peter Sagan to try and double up. He's won this race before, but the pace is def definitely on. Astana pushing hard at the front of the, uh, you know, the first group in the road, the main peloton now trying to be shut down from uh, behind with uh, Tinkoff. Well, meanwhile, as there's panic in the third group on the road, in the bunch, like it was Roman Kreuziger, put to work on the front for Tinkoff. The riders in front still working extremely hard. This is Fabien Grelier of Direct Energy, a 21-year-old, really putting on a fantastic show today. They'll be having to do longer turns on the front now. This is the group behind being led by Lamprey Merida. It's like one of the riders from Katusha has managed to get in the back there as well. ag 2 are also represented. And this is the chase behind. No, this is, sorry, this is the chase, this is the group in front. Looks like actually it's Mikhail Nieve who is in that group as well. So two riders from Ke Team Sky, excuse me. Thought there was only one. So Nieve now, the Spaniard, King of the Mountains in the Giro d'Italia this year. Also took a notable stage win. Fine, fine climate. This course clearly to his liking. So Sky in a pretty strong position. They're happy to assist with Lamprey and also with Astana. And it has put a couple of other teams, including the team of former winner, and last year's winner, Lotta Sudal, on the back foot. Interesting situation playing out. 15 seconds is the gap between the group containing Geraint Thomas and the peloton now. Of course, this move, Brian, does put a little bit of pressure on teams like Tinkoff. So it's in there. Uh, although this, this move might not necessarily succeed, what it does is apply pressure to the other groups as well who wear out their kind of or use their resources. Um, it isn't something you really want to be put into position. I didn't expect such a big group to start going clear. But as I say, some teams, there will be definitely a few alarm bells ringing now. There will be as soon as that information gets back uh, to the teams uh, in the team car and then it'll be relayed back up to the riders and you know they have to make a very quick uh, decision of uh, coming up because when you get a group uh, that's been push, push forwards of you know 25 30 riders and you get the likes of Astana and, and Team Sky uh, all willing to contribute then you know you have to worry about it and uh, we see the front of this chasing group now Astana, Lamprey a giant uh, Alperson, a lot of strong teams wanting to be involved with the action, but just look behind Mark, the gap is still about uh, 15 seconds. A lot of uh, people at the back of this group, you have to turn your, 
you, the thoughts off to, to the back of this group and, and not worry about uh, things uh, because you have to go as what your team are uh, trying to, to do and, and, and tell you over the, over the radio. See Lamprey just looking back, they're not really happy about these things. Forget about what everybody else is doing, just concentrate on what you're doing because uh, the longer uh, this looking around and not helping and splits starting to happen, the easier the chase is behind. It certainly is. Well, Garan Thomas done a couple of turns on the front. He's been assisted by a couple of riders from Giant Alps in there. Sam Uman is the rider in second wheel. The one team that isn't contributing, unsurprisingly, to the move is Orica Bike Exchange. Michael Matthews is not there, nor is Adam Yates. It does look like they've only got one rider in there in the form of Chris Yule Jensen. So Orica Bike Exchange, I'd imagine, would have to start lending a little bit of assistance to the chase. The fair play for these four riders in front. Two minutes and 10 seconds, that's the gap back to the pellets. And of course we have that group of about 25 riders in between. There's the rider from Bora, just in the center of your screen, who takes them across the line. Lucas Postelberger rolls across the line, or near the line, should I say. And they cross the line on this occasion. It will be three laps to go. And you could just see the riders looping round in the last kilometer. They're not too far behind them. Look at the face of Fabian Grelier. He's a, a Neo Pro. His first year with Direct Energy. He's got a contract through to the back end of 2017. And really trying to put on a show. Great shot there of the Peloton being led by BMC there. The big team to have missed. But well, they've got a rider in the move. Clearly not the permutation that they want. Three laps to go. Yeah, there's a few teams. But it's, it's, a, it's a game of chess. And you don't want to burn your matches. And... Uh, they, BMC have got, it uh, looks like they've got, is it two riders towards it? Is it one rider? I think it's two riders towards the back. So it's not the, the riders they want. And, uh, you know, they've got two riders at the back of this uh, group. They're not contributing. They've put riders towards the front. So have, uh, so have Team Sky. So they've got Geraint and uh, Naevi there. But they're not, it's not what they want. And so they've come to the front to, to try and shut it down. They certainly have. But one team... They certainly haven't put riders in number in that group, which is a little bit of a surprise, considering the way they've ridden recently. They had their 50th win the other day, well, yesterday in fact. After Tony Martin took the time trial stage of the Tour of Britain. They have had an absolutely fantastic year win-wise. They didn't get anybody, but well, they just got Petro Vakoc in the top 10 on Friday in Quebec. He was ninth, but uh, Julian Alaphilippe and Matteo Trentin were the main animators at the back end of that race. They are not in this move. To trying to identify the one rider from Etix who's just near the back but Chris Jorgensen interesting now starting to ride through and now it's Cannondale who's starting to ride hard on the front assisted by BMC also Luke Rowe of Team Sky there Gianni Moscon tucked in about fourth wheel the young Italian to short Schleck there as well the one who's going to take up the pacemaking the next time up the coat to Camille and Oud. It's Cannondale now driving hard through the finish. This is looking pretty dangerous. Yeah, they're just trying to shut things down now. And, uh, you know, that's what you need teammates for. You can just sit there, don't panic, and, uh, you know, let your teammates do it. So three laps to go of the Grand Prix Cyclist de Montreal. A total distance of 205.7 kilometers. We have just under three laps to go of this tough 12.1 kilometer course. Three climbs, the Côte de Camillion Oud, the Côte de la Polytechnique, and the short but steep Avenue de Parc. And our leaders now are being chased by a large group of very strong riders indeed. Lamprey Merida have three riders in here. So do Astana, Team Sky have a couple of riders. FDJ are represented as our Mobistar. The Swiss road champion is here for Yam Cycling in the form of Jonathan Fumio. And also Lotto El Yumbo. And there's Jasper Stoyven, more at home in the classics. And it looks like Pim Lichthart actually near the back there as well, the former Belgian champion. He's going to be moving and leaving Lotto this, well, for next season. Moving across to one of the French squads. Interesting move there for that young man just sat at the back of the palace and he will not assist i don't think lotto suda will be particularly happy that he's the only rider in that move and this chase group eating into the lead of our four riders in front but also gradually pulling away from the bunch now yeah 35 seconds now and i think it's uh, Lawrence uh, de plus uh, for uh, etics quick step so 
There is uh, a lot of permutations still to happen, but the race has definitely started. There are some teams, especially uh, Lamprey. Lamprey have got probably one of the favourites in that group, and that's why they're pushing on. And Manueli uh, uh, Mori is the, the rider pushing hard behind on this climb. But still 35 kilometres ago, this race all been squeezed now, and uh, the pressure is on uh, from both the uh, chasing group and, and also from the peloton. Well, you can hear. The crowd cheering on their riders. Great ride by Ben Perry and Matteo Dalsin. Still at the head of a race, a world tour race, no less. And the pressure is really on. There's two riders from Orica Bike Exchange in this group. It looks like it's Chris Yule Jensen. And also there, it does look like it might be, yeah, Daryl Impey as well in that group. And Daryl Impey likes this sort of course. He can finish extremely well. Very fast rider indeed, but he can get over these shorter climbs. But Lamprey really pressing on with the pace there. Alfredo also there for FDJ. And the, the slight figure of Mikel Nieve rising out of the saddle. Uh, they really are pressing on. This is going to start hurting. Be interesting to see what riders manage to stay in contact on this climb. It looks like Lawrence de Plus of Etix near the back of that group really starting to struggle. And I can tell you, Brian, that isn't the rider that Etix Quicks that will want in this move. No, and uh, the way uh, uh, Lamprey are riding, the, obviously they're, they're dragging a, a lot of riders with them. And... Manuele Mori is putting a, a big dig uh, up this uh, climb already and he's, he's kind of disappeared, uh, you know, halfway into this uh, group. So they d really don't want to drag everybody up this climb. And this man here, Elise, uh, one of the favourites for this race. So, well, probably he might wait or he might decide to, to, to go now, but a smaller group of maybe six to eight riders would pr probably be better than, uh, you know, dragging all these riders. Oh, and Ron Rod is not having such a good day. It's Adam Yates there, not looking very happy at all. In, in actual fact, he's just done a U-turn. We will not be seeing Adam Yates figuring in this race. And it looks like number 204 as well, Matteo Dalsin, after spending the vast majority of the race at the head of affairs. By the look of his face there, Brian, is definitely either succumbing to cramp or just pure and utter fatigue. But a brave, brave ride. Normally rides on the Continental Silver Pro pro cycling team i think his teammate there benjamin perry managed to get another couple of points we'll get confirmation that of that in relation to the king of the mountains prize just shuffling forward on his saddle there you can always tell when a rider is in a little bit of distress when they just start to shift forward on the saddle and meanwhile john alpson are pressing on with this effort one minute and three seconds it is to our leaders to this large group of around 25 riders behind Obviously, Team Sky, Brian, pretty happy with this move, putting Nieve on the front there. Yeah, you think that uh, getting Thomas and uh, Nieve, you just see uh, Nathan Haas at the back here. He's starting to struggle, a very good uh, ride uh, in Quebec, but uh, struggling now, it's, I think it's a, a little bit difficult for him. Whether he's not recovered well, but many of these riders, you know, double header Friday and Sunday, uh, with one day in between, some of them can do it, some of them can't, but just look at behind, you know, this gap uh, to the peloton. The peloton has come up fairly rapidly. I think it's uh, a few more riders trying to come across this gap, but I think in this lap, the uh, peloton will uh, catch the um, the uh, front group of about 25. Well, there's Charles and Bantano, the stage winner in the Tour de France, just at the back there, really struggling. That was quite inter interesting, wasn't it? You saw Pantano was stage winner. He's moving over to Trek Segafredo next year, and also Adam Yates, both high flyers in the Tour de France, clearly fatigued by a very, very long season. Normally, if they're in form, they'd be pretty happy on that climb, but as you said, Brian, the gap has now really, really come down. Been a real acceleration and a turn of speed at the front of the peloton. It looks like this group will come back together. But meanwhile, Aston are still happy to ride at the front, but I'd say that gap now really come down only about between five and ten seconds. Yeah, but it's the effort it's made. You can just see it's the uh, peloton are strung out behind gaps appearing all over the place, and it was just always it was always too big a, a group um, to stay out there. Next, uh, Sam Uman is going on the uh, counter attack for Giant Alpeson, and if they can create, this is probably the best time just before the junction happens. If a small group can be created, then. You know, there's a good possibility if the uh, if it's right, if the right riders are in the, the, the right move. And just as we see it, Sam Uman try to do something. It's just too fast at this point. But, you know, the next time up the uh, climb could be uh, fairly crucial if a uh, group gets away. 
with a rider on the front now for Movistar is the Portuguese rider Nelson Oliveira. He's the only rider from Movistar in this group, but he's happy to press on in front. In fact, there is a... Okay. <laughs> Adding riders into the mix, there is another rider from Mobistar there, but the bunch are close behind now. I think this group was just a little bit too big. Too many passengers in that group as the riders rush down the descent of the Côte de Camillian Oud. And next up, there's not much rest at all before they take in the coat of the Côte de Polytechnique. I did notice Peter Sagan in those World Championships band just sat comfortably in the middle of the bunch. Meanwhile, we head up front to our three leaders left in front with 32.1 kilometers to go. The gap is 43 seconds. It's combined with the very difficult parkour, the climbs, remember, just under 4,000 meters of elevation gain today in just 205 kilometers. Very challenging course indeed. There are our three leaders. There were six. Now there are three. Postelberger is there, Benjamin Perry and Fabian Grelier. He's the man on the front for direct energy. The man on the front of the group behind, in fact, it is the peloton. That's young Sam Uman. What a year he has had so far. Took out the Tour de Lain just a few weeks back. At the beginning of August, only 21 years of age and a real prodigious talent. He was also 10th overall in the Tour de poitou charon So clearly in good form at the back end of the season. We're just under, we're just over, or sorry, just spot on 29 kilometers to go. Things really starting to come back together. But at this point of the race, Brian, although it's not the same distance as a full-on classic, 250 k's, it's 200 kilometers, you still need to measure your effort. Still, with two and a half laps to go, a lot of riders just making sure they're not doing too much at the front because I think it's all going to happen on the last lap. Yeah, it's hotting up over the last couple of laps. It's uh, hurt a lot of riders, and there's still a few riders uh, willing to, to press on here. I believe that's uh, the young rider from uh, Movistar there, Pedrero. Antonio Pedrero at the front. Uh, he's just moved over now, so obviously, uh, you know, a pat in the back there from one of these. That's what you want. You know, you do a job there, you know, a nice pat in the back from one of these teammates. It's always nice. Uh, when you're a young rider and trying to get involved with the race. Just like Sam Uman as well. Sam Uman, as you say, uh, rightly so, Matt. He's got some good form, but I just think he's, he's shown a lot over the last lap, and he should be kind of trying to duck and dive a little bit because there are a lot of riders in this peloton just saving, saving um, for, you know, the uh, the laps that are coming up. He certainly is. Well, Uman clearly feeling very, very good. He's dropped back into the fray. Again, but they've got some other very good riders on board for Giant Alpacin. Simon Geschke is their protected rider. I haven't seen him too much, but again, we didn't see anything of Peter Sagan the other day until he popped out and took the win. But things really hotting up. This is the back end of the peloton. Look at the damage that's being caused by this relentless pace. The rider's now dropping down. It won't be long before they're coming up the Avenue de Parc once more. Short climb up the finishing straight. You just see that long snaking line at the back end there, Brian. It's not where you want to be now. You just see Alfredo coming up, and Tommy Vokler just had a wee look there from uh, Direct Energy and thought, oh, might be a little too early, but uh, Alfredo comes up to the front. Uh, Gote still involved there uh, for uh, AG2R, kick out the corner. BMC now involved at the ahead, but uh, Tommy Vokler just sitting there quietly in fourth place. That was a nice bit of sportsmanship there. But yeah, Tommy Vockel near the head of affairs, but a little bit of a, a handshake there. That's wonderful to see. You do often see it. These riders have been at the head of affairs all day. They know that their days are numbered. So a handshake there, handshake all round. Postelberger there shaking hands with Grillier. Then it was Postelberger shaking hands with Ben Perry. Really good to see. They'll keep fighting on. They might last for another few kilometers. They're certainly not giving up just yet. I'd imagine that Perry will get confirmation Perry should have done enough to take the points for, or enough points, sorry, to take the, the uh, sprinter's classification. And meanwhile, the powerfully built Jesper Stuyven is on the front. This is a man that I think is going to pick up a few monuments in years to come. He's an extremely powerful rider. Took out a quite remarkable victory in Kona Brussels, Kona earlier in the year. Rode the bunch off his wheel to win solo. You don't see that very often. Yeah, he's uh, looking like a young uh, Fabian Cancellara. <laughs> Looks remarkably similar, doesn't he? You know, you know, Fabian, of course, hanging up his wheels, gold medalist in the Olympic Games. Not here, 
for this Jesper Stuyven. Again, when you think about Tom Bonin retiring next year, the Belgians do need another big classic specialist. They've got some great climbers. They've got Tim Wellens, Taj Panut. There's talent there. But for the Pave, I think the mantle will be taken by Jesper Stuyven. He is really hotly tipped. Seems to be de dealing with the pressure and clearly climbing pretty well today as well. Yes, uh, not easy at all. We've already seen the uh, young Sam Bennett uh, dangling towards the back. I think he was just about uh, being dropped. And when you come to the front, Stuyven was in that fr uh, front group of uh, almost 30 riders now pushing hard in the front. And, you know, obviously they'll be thinking of, um, you know, trying to get something from this race uh, from uh, their man. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. A lot of people keep trying to keep their powder dry at this moment in time, but uh, for sure, teams are starting to play their, uh, you know, play their, their cards now. And uh, for Trek Segafredo, uh, Molima had, uh, you know, good enough race in uh, Quebec, and I'll be thinking of uh, trying to win this race today. You know, after a very good win that he had quite a few weeks ago in um, uh, San Sebastian. Yeah, it was a great win by Mollema in San Sebastian. Such bad luck. Riding high in the Tour de France. Had that awful crash. I think he was lying in second position when he had that crash. Ready to die. Time trial of his life. And talking of classics riders, Tom Bowden in the centre of the screen there. Looking majestic at the moment. Bowden's in great form. Three wins this year. Dimension data also moving to the front, making sure, Brian, that their rides are in good position at the bottom of this climb, because that is going to be absolutely critical. There's only two laps to go next time through to the penultimate climb of the Côte de Camillianoud. Remember, it's a very difficult climb indeed. 1.8 kilometers in length, 8% average gradient. They drop off that, then go up the Côte de Polytechnique again. 6% gradient, but pitching up at 11. Jesper Stoyven looks like he's about to make contact with the three riders in front. Another feeling that he's got the sort of the power to go straight through. They'll be absolutely exhausted. Bonin goes wide round the corner, sweeps around. It's on Bonin in good, good form. Took the Brussels Cycling Classic a couple of weeks back. And it's Postelberger who's going clear, perhaps thinking he can escape and maybe crest the climb because there's Mac a lot of points on offer next time up. For the laps 15, 16, and 17, 10, 3, and 1 points on offer. So Postelberger thinking that he can seize the King of the Mountains by perhaps getting that. It'd be nice if we could see the overall. The Postelberger rolls through for Border Argon 18. Great rid of riding by him. And unsurprisingly, Jesper Stoyven has gone straight through the break. Shaking his head there, Brian. Perhaps he's not too confident that the move at the moment is the right thing to do. So just eases off the pedals. He knows the bunch are breathing down his neck. Just takes that moment to compose himself again before we hit the climb. Yeah, it's going to be, <laughs> the race is going to be on. It's already been on for the last uh, couple of laps and uh, a lot of uh, riders that we've not even kind of mentioned uh, are still to get involved. But uh, Etik's quick step starting to come to the front of this uh, front group. Everybody kind of vying for position. Posterberger still out there on his own. A very good rider, Neil Pro, as we've already said, former Austrian champion, 24 years of age, and um, last year won the um, Anpost uh, Ross. Yeah, a race we know very, very well indeed. This looks like he's slowing down there. This penultimate climb of the Côte de Camille Nud is really going to hurt. It's going to be very difficult, Brian, for him, I think, to hold on. He's got a handful of seconds, maybe 10 or 15 seconds. There's Jesper Stoyven. Whether he'll continue with his effort, just knocks it down onto the small ring. That looks like Rafa Maika, the Polish road champion, leading up. We know he can climb. Twice a winner of the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France. Took that title again this year. But meanwhile, Postelberger up in front. Still pressing on. I think he knows deep down he's not going to win this race, but he's going to fight all the way as long as he can. Looks like Gregory Rast, is it, on the front now? Yeah, Gregory Rast uh, moving, and uh, it does very much look like uh, Trek Segafredo are, um, you know, playing with their numbers now, trying to keep it as hard as possible. He knows if uh, he can go over this climb, he can actually help uh, Molima if Molima decides to go on the attack. So, just at the front of the peloton, you can see Etix, you can see Maika, but uh, for the first time, Bossel Berger, the Austrian, has got company from the peloton. He has. I don't think he's going to have company for too long. I think Rast will go straight by him. He sits on his wheel for a little bit, just gets that little bit of a slipstream. There is a slight strip, slipstream effect, if I can get my words out, on climbs as well. Not as much, as, of course, on the flat. 
But the grading just eases a little bit here. Remember, 8%. It's pretty constant grading all the way to the top. But meanwhile, it's game over for Tom Bowden. Yeah, I think this he was a raider. Race, is it? Yeah. He was a raider at setting the pace at the front of the peloton. And so he's done his job, and, and that's it. And uh, he's looking for a way out. He certainly is. I think he's going to do a U-turn. We saw Adam Yates do a U-turn a little bit later on. He'll just ride back to his hotel. Job done. Good preparation for him, though, for the World Championships in Qatar. I know he wants to win another title. Took the Rainbow Bands 11 years ago. Can he win a second title? That remains to be seen. But meanwhile, Postelberger and Gregory Rust lead the race, but only by a handful of seconds from a close. Well, Peloton very, very close behind, being led at the moment by one of the finest climbers in the world, Rafa Maika of Poland. And again, it looks like... Uh, Stuyven comes to the front. Yes, they, want, they want to make it hard because... Rast came up there, and he can, you know, he can't, he can't, can't even work with the Postelberger. It's very difficult. And uh, Michael was setting a, a really nice tempo. Um, he was a rider that could possibly try and get an attack, try and make it difficult. But they're just keeping it nice and easy. They're trying to help um, Sagan. And if anything's going to hurt Sagan, it's these climbs. But Cyril yeah. Gautier decides he's not having none of it where they're setting tempo at the front and making it easier for some of the sprinters like uh, Sagan, uh, keeping a tempo high. Um, he wants to inject a little bit of pace. He wants to encourage a few riders to uh, to possibly go across to him and, and create a small group. And just as we say that, uh, it lo does look as if uh, Trek Segafredo could be rast again, just trying to push on. Or is it, in fact, I don't think it's Molima at this moment. I think he's kind of sitting back. Yeah, I don't think it's the style of Molima. Molima is waiting, waiting, waiting at the moment. We did see him near the front. He's just in the center on the right-hand side, just next to Stoven, but it's FDJ getting in the mix now, cr trying to cross the gap to that rider from Trek, Segafredo. And he's just one of the lighter climbers from that squad. And looks like it's uh, certainly not out of Dondo. Looks like it might be... Uh, Peter Stettiner, I think Peter Stettiner, yeah. It's looking at the build there. Looks like it's Stettiner. Looks like Jürgen... Uh, Sorry, Yelly Van and Ertz is also just on the front of the bunch for Lotta Sudal. Just dragging clear. Well, he's just gone clear of Rafa Maika. Interesting, Rafa Maika isn't jumping around. He's setting just a smooth, even rhythm. He's not going to ride at a staccato speed. He knows that those pace changes do upset the rhythm of, uh, of uh, Peter Sagan, of course. So he'll be wanting to keep a nice, smooth rhythm and just keep these guys in sight. And that's what we're just uh, speculating just before there, that Micah would be a rider that would attack and, and go with these riders, but uh, deciding that uh, it's not to be, and it's all for uh, Peter Sagan today. And that's Pim Lichthardt at the back for Lotto Sudal, weaving all over the road. When you see a rider in distress out the back on a big gear, that's generally the last thing. When you haven't got any suplex left, sometimes it's just about putting in as big a gear as you can and hoofing it over, using a lot of torque. But meanwhile, there's another rider just coming across the gap slightly, but it looks like it might be uh, at Uman again, or Simon Geschke. So several little flurries of attacks now coming over the top of this climb. There's certainly Tommy Vockler there for direct energy. So we crest the climb for the penultimate time. It is Peter Stetwood. It is Peter Stetner who's just there, just moving into third wheel. FDJ, there. a couple of little splits here now in the peloton. I wonder if that's Anthony Rue. So the points there over the top, 10 points there for Cyril Gautier of AG2 up. And meanwhile, several riders getting in the aero tuck. I don't think this gap is big enough for this small group here. Cannondale just on the front. Trying to save as much energy as they can by freewheeling down the descent of the Côte de Camillian Oud. But of course now, next up on the agenda is the Côte de la Polytechnique. Yeah, it very much looks as if there's a lot of uh, lot of riders and teams playing a waiting game. Uh, Tommy Vockler never waits for anybody, so he's decided he wants to uh, to keep it going as uh, much as possible. And, you know, small group, he wants... it. At this stage, sometimes you go to the front and, you know, really push it on, but he knows it's going to be very difficult, and that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to encourage everybody to, to combine well to, to, uh, with each other, and he's getting annoyed with uh, everybody because they know this, they're under team orders, there's another uh, lap coming up, uh, other climbs to come, so there's a lot of tired legs, and they, they're not committing. Nobody's committing at this moment. Well, Gautier just goes through on the front. Sam Uman on his wheel. Not much organization. Stettiner is just behind. The other rider 
for Orica Bike Exchange in there looks like Chris Yul Jensen. With just over 20 kilometers to go, a lap and a half of this very difficult 12.1 kilometer course. The breakaway that has animated the vast majority of this race has finally been brought to Hill. And the last survivor of the breakaway was the Austrian rider for Border Argon 18, Lucas Postelberger. He was caught by the bunch on the slopes of the penultimate major climb of this race, the Côte de Camillion Oud. And now a small break has gone clear. And leading the way at the moment on the right-hand side, just flicking his elbow there in the red and black of John Alperson is the young Dutchman, Sam Uman. And for company, he's got Cyril Gauthier of FDJ, of, sorry, of ag 2 up And also a rider there from FDJ. But it really is action stations now. And this group slowly starting to drag themselves clear. Yeah, Etik's also in here. Tommy Vaucler, as you say, Jo Jensen for uh, Orica Bike Exchange. But Stettiner, as you say, as well. At the back there, also a rider from Astana. No rider for Team Sky in this move. Nobody from Lotto. Nobody from BMC either, so a lot of the big, well, there are several big World Tour teams that have missed this, missed this move, and significantly no riders from Tinkoff as well, or Mobistar. Yeah, just a stand on the back here, but nobody really wanting to push BMC like they did previously, coming to the front, uh, trying to control things. Tinkoff also in there, Lamprey, Sky. There's a lot of teams just sitting by. They know it's going to come down to the, the last time up the, the, the main climb here and the last lap. So there's a lot of uh, riders there waiting. But if you can steal a little bit and, you know, help your uh, your teammates on that final lap. But really impressed over the last couple of laps with Sam Uman. This uh, That's a rider, 154 at the back for a giant Alberson. But he has been showing his cards, but that's probably what he's been asked to do. It certainly is. Make it hard for the other teams. And this breakaway has definitely put a couple of the big teams on the back foot. And the rider there is Petra Vakoc, very strong Czech, well, former Czech road champion. And he is a rider who can sprint pretty well. He was ninth in the GP Quebec on Friday. So clearly a rider in form and very, very dangerous indeed. So clearly he's got instructions to ride as well. Should this group stay away, he would have a very, very good chance. And then the rider in the center of your picture there, number 188, with that very distinctive style. Never won this race before, but he has won the Grand Prix Quebec. He won the Grand Prix Qu Quebec in 2010 in its inaugural edition. But Tommy Vockler never fell to surprise. That wonderful victory earlier in the year in the Tour de Yorkshire, of course. Not such a strong race, but also a very tactically astute race as well. Also got uh, Diego Ross in there for uh, Astana. Very good uh rider over this uh, type of course but it's only 15 seconds too many other teams are not involved and uh, i'm afraid to say that uh, you know they'll be chasing hard and uh, it's going to make it difficult for these these riders to stay away yeah, i think too many of the big teams not represented and just as we said that tommy vockler goes clear attacks on the right hand side of the road in that traditional huge gear still got so much strength and well into the autumn of his career, but rides so, so aggressively. Countless races he's been the main animator of. Winner of stages of the Tour de France, long spell in the yellow jersey several years ago, but loves to fight. But as you said, Brian, the bunch not too far behind now. I think the gap has been foreshortened by the climb. It's saying 15 seconds, but that attack on the Côte de la Polytechnique has split this group, and it looks like Gautier trying to go across. Ex teammates, of course. He looked behind. He looked behind. Tommy Vokler looked behind and saw the uh, the peloton coming. And uh, normally at that stage, the, the breaker we would set up, okay, we're caught. But Vokler intelligently decided to to try a, an effort. He wants to be there. He wants to be involved um, with the uh, the fine on this race. Maybe he doesn't have the legs like uh, you know some of the other riders, but is trying to gain a little bit of time before the uh, the real racing starts. Oh, Tommy Vokler turned pro way back in 2000. Now 37 years of age. Four stage wins in the Tour de France over the years. Former champion of France as well. Riding extremely strongly here. 12 seconds is the gap. Cyril Gauthier now goes to the front. French well represented FDJ also in this move. They had a great ride by Anthony Roux, who was uh, placed third in the GP Quebec. 
FTJ riding a very, very good race indeed. But look at the face of Goat of uh, Tommy Vockler there. I was about to say, where's the tongue? And there it was. Tommy Vockler on the tops. He just gives 100% in every race he rides. He wasn't fully committed when uh, the group is all together. He's fully committed now. He's with an ex-teammate, uh, so they've obviously just communicating. But Rosa is almost there. You can just see him getting a push from the front side, the Jew rider. Still a small group, still a small uh, advantage. And uh, this race looks as if it's going to come down to the last lap. Well, it looks like Diego Rosa is about to bring the two Frenchmen to heel. And meanwhile, Rafa Maika shouts on the radio. I'd imagine he wants a little bit of assistance up front. They've got Lamprey there. Lamprey, another team we haven't mentioned. They haven't got anybody in the move. I'm pretty sure they'll assist Tinkoff as well. I can see Luke Rowe on his radio as well. Calling to see where his riders are. There's lots of riders now out of the back. This uh, group, although it is big, it's splitting. And when the speed is this high, it's very, very difficult, Brian, isn't it, on a course like this. For riders, for team riders, have got a job to do to commit at the front. It's very, very difficult to organise a concerted chase. And you've got a few dangerous riders in this front group. We've already seen from Quebec, you mentioned Vakoc. Um, he very capable of, uh, you know, staying away in a, a smaller group and uh, winning the sprint. So it's uh, all pressure at the front of the peloton. They, they want to bring this back and they want to bring this back before they uh, go on to this uh, final uh, ascent. Well, they go Stetson, we know it's uh, kind of an obvious, the other rider, or the rider from FDJ there, Rosa gauthier Ugohul, the Canadian, Sam Omen we know, and then Tommy Vockler. So kind of Lovis there for FDJ, happy to ride through. And just sat at the back. He's had a great ride so far. Chris Yul Jensen just checks the gap behind. I think he'll be one of the riders that uh, might not necessarily ride too hard here. No, he doesn't go through, just sits back onto the wheel of Diego Rosa. No reason really for him to ride. Of course, he has Michael Matthews to look after, who was fifth in Quebec. Gautier rolling through, of course. He was a teammate, as you said, Brian, in the Europe car days with Tommy Vockler. Spent many, many years together on the squad of Jean-René Bernadou. But look at this turn by Rafa Maika. He spent the last half a lap on the front. He rode the entire climb of the Côte de Camille Nude, all in the service, quite clearly, of Peter Sagan. That's what sacrifice is all about. It looks like he's going to try and close this gap on his own. And whilst he's riding hard on the front at that sort of rate, that's why nobody else at the moment is assisting. Yeah, it's been a huge effort. He's got uh, Brent Buchwalter just behind them as well for BMC. They've got uh, Greg Van Avermaet uh, up uh, towards the front. So Manuele Maury, I think it is, has done his turn at the front, swinging over. Brent Buchwalter just coming to the front for uh, BMC. They've got numbers uh, right up there towards, but the cohesion is not quite there in this uh, front group of about, uh, I think it's nine riders. Uh, with riders, some riders willing to push on, like Gautier and Vokler, but the other riders just, uh, you know, kind of sitting at the back. Yul Jensen, I think, was uh, one of the ones that caused that split. He doesn't want this to go, and that's why he's uh, he's there, which is good for Orica Bike Exchange, but he's not committing to it because he's got uh, his options, uh, his team options back in the uh, peloton. Well, Vakoc not riding either. Peter Stettin has sat at the back as well. He's happy not to ride. Looks as if he's hurting a little bit, but he rode the last climb extremely well to get into this split. And there's the bunch being led by BMC. That gap has really come down now. Only about seven or eight seconds. Full pelt down here. Ten seconds, it's saying there. BMC round that corner, and that is a greatly reduced bunch now. And next time through the finish, up the Avenue de Parc, it will be one lap to go. There is the finish just on the other side of the road. So Gauthier of AG2R on the front now for France. They've just gone under the kilometer to go board. Next time through, it will be 1K to go. Of course, they have one lap of this circuit still to climb, and that means three, well, one climb of the Côte de Camille Anoud, and another climb of the Côte de la Polytechnique. Two very difficult climbs still to come. Diego Rosa on the front, throws his bottle off, lightens the load. Gautier on his wheel. In the brown, blue and white of AG2R, former French champion Tommy Vockler is there for direct energy in that gold and yellow kit, but closely behind is the peloton, and it looks like they are going to be caught just on the line here, Brian. Yeah, that's what they wanted to do, just catch them before they go on to the, uh, the main climb, and uh, it looks as if it's going to happen, and a lot of the teams are uh, looking behind to see what's happening. Oh, just coming into the final lap now. 
Diego Rosa on the front for Italy and to the Kazakh squad. Astana, he launches himself through. Sam Oman looks over his shoulder. The young rider from the Netherlands and John Alperson. And meanwhile, BMC drive hard on the front of this reduced peloton. And say about 80 riders left, if that. And Diego Rosa takes the belt. Final lap now of the Grand Prix Cyclist de Montreal. Rosa rolls across the line. He has taken flight from this group. Very good move there. 41.6 kilometers an hour average speed on this very difficult course. Remember, just under 4,000 meters of, of elevation gain by the time they cross the line. That really is some real high speed, Brian. Yeah, and they've also got to contest with a, a headwind up the finishing straight as well uh, when they come round. So it's, you know, into the last kilometre, tailwind into that hairpin and back up. It's Diego Rosa of Astana, just when everything was all coming back together, decides to uh, to counter-attack. But it's, the drive is into this uh, climb and it's BMC trying to take control of the front of the peloton. Well, Rosa just rounds the corner, just on the foot slopes of the Côte de Camilla Nud. BMC are there, still Rafa Mica in second wheel there, the Polish road champion, Peter Sagan just moves up the outside, looking very, very dangerous indeed. Diego Rosa lifts himself out of the saddle, he leads the race at the moment, and in a couple of moments' time, just behind, you will see the bunch for Diego Rosa, very, very good climber indeed. And whether he has enough in the legs to stay clear of the group up this climb remains to be seen, the climb, 8%. A steady average gradient all the way up, 1,800 metres in length. It looks as if Team Sky now and Luke Rowe on the front. Yeah, he's pushing hard and, uh, you know, he's been used up, so he's making a big effort now. Diego Rosa just about to be brought back as more riders uh, start to look at uh, hitting out. Still a long way to go in this climb. You can just see uh, Peter Sagan right up there towards the front, giving himself uh, plenty of options, plenty of movements, but... You know, I'm thinking that, um, you know, Lamprey are definitely trying to want to go on the attack here and try and do something in this uh, climb. Uh, one of the riders from AG2R goes clear, Ben Gaster. He drives clear on the front, but it's stalemate on the front. This is very, very interesting. This is playing into the hands of some of the fast men in this group. That is a sizable group that is still at the head of affairs. Greg Van Avermaet is there, second in Quebec. He's the Olympic champion, and the rider sat in second wheel at the moment is Peter Sagan, the world road race champion and winner of the GP Quebec a couple of days back. Gasteur starts to go clear. Who's going to take up the pacemaking at the front? Will we see an attack? I didn't expect this last climb of the Côte de Camille en Oud. It looks as if there's a lot of brinkmanship going on here. I thought there'd be a few more attacks and it's uh, Rafa Maika again on the front. He's put in so much work. Simon Geschke is there. There's Balka Molima on the right-hand side for Trek. Sega Fredo in the white. Diego Ulissi is there as well for Lamprey Merida. All of the race favourites massing now, Brian, at the front. But do you see what happened there? Uh, Lamprey uh, came up in numbers, right? The Heisadau is in the left-hand side trying to go on the attack. But uh, Micah came back up. As soon as he saw Lamprey coming to the front, he just wants to keep a steady tempo. He certainly does. Just a smooth tempo. He didn't go after Ryder Heisadau. Heisadau, of course... This is one of the last races of his career. He spent his last year with Trek Segafredo, the former winner of the Giro d'Italia. Would dearly love to win this race on home soil. He's done a good ride so far, gritting his teeth. What a career he has had. It's just, it just looks like it's uh, Roman Bardet he's actually got for company. It is Roman Bardet, the Frenchman, second in the Tour de France. He launches a stinging attack on the right-hand side. Lampre and Arida lead the bunch behind. Great move here by Bardet. It is an excellent move. He's just waiting, waiting, waiting until uh, Heisadal uh, swung over and the uh, counter-attack. But it's uh, Lamprey, as expected, taking control at the front. Uh, Molima also up there for uh, Trek Segafredo, but just just behind him, making an effort now, is uh, Peter Sagan, the world champion. Well, look who's flanking Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan is fifth on the road there in that world champion's jersey. It is Diego Ulissi on the front now. Just behind him is Rui Costa, the former world road champion. Rafa Maika, the Polish champion. His day is done. He's put in an absolutely Herculean effort in the service of his world road champion teammate, Peter Sagan, today. Great ride by Rafa Maika. He now drops off the back. Ulissi is on the front now for Lamprey Marina. Rui Costa on his wheel. 
You wonder who the team leader is for them. And it looks wow. like it is Costa. What an attack here by Costa. Yeah, you could just see that everybody was really hurting and Ray Costa just, uh, just <laughs> just went on the attack and Mollema struggling to go with it you know and uh, the world champion and trying to uh, to come across now there's a, an impressive attack by Ray Costa because he, he hit them when they were hurting the most and uh, you know Sky I think I've got Mosk on there and uh, you know this is a, a really impressive performance by Ray Costa Peter Sagan just moves over he can't let him go he knows that Ray Costa is on some good form Van Avermaet is just following at the moment Uran is there they come over the top of this climb it really depends on what um, Sagan does here if he, f if he moves over to the left hand side or the right hand side if nobody rides then Ray Costa is going to be very difficult to be uh, brought back well, Rui Costa takes the points over the top, but it's not the points that he is concerned about. He wants to try and win this race. He was 13th on Friday, so clearly in good form. He split the group. That is Geraint Thomas going at a, quite a different speed. I think he'll be detached from the group. He's there with uh, Tommy Vocklip. They're just at the back of the bunch, just drifting over the top. So not a day for these riders now. They are well detached. Mikel Nieve also there. But the man in front, Rui Costa, is Bolkamolema. He's trying to get across to the Portuguese rider. Great riding here by Rui Costa at the back end of this race. Two climbs to go. Well, this is the picture of Bolkamolema of the Netherlands and Trek Segafredo. He glances over his shoulder. Great rider, but to Rui Costa putting in a real effort it's really opened up a gap that was some attack nobody could respond Peter Sagan tried to counter so did Mollema but Rui Costa in full flight now Brian well everybody was hurting at that time you can just see the faces and all of a sudden uh, Rui Costa just put a dig in um, Mollema just to be about to be joined by the uh, the world champion I think it's uh, Jan Izagiri it's up there towards the front as well but Alisi is just getting that a free right now and uh, you know Lampley have played it well they've uh, tried to create something a few laps ago and um, they've now got Rui Costa and the lead Elise in this uh, group behind he can just sit on the wheels uh, Alaphilippe is also there Van Avermaet I think it's uh, Moscow and so it's uh, an interesting group but looking a bit further back and uh, they haven't got a big advantage to the uh, the group behind they haven't got a big advantage but the advantage for our leader is growing Rui Costa riding really hard I was interested to see if these riders would be happy to ride with the world champion is trying to get a gel down him I'd imagine that's like a caffeine gel <laughs> to give him a bit of a pep he's only got 6.8 k's to go Costa still plows a lonely furrow out in front another glance under his shoulder and now the Olympic road champion hits the front Greg Van Avermaet of BMC he has Julian Alaphilippe of France and Etix Quickstep in tow and third wheel there is Peter Sagan. No yeah. real cohesion here. No. They're all looking at each other. This is fascinating stuff. Now when you get to, you know, the big stars like uh, Sagan and Avermaet, you, you've got Alaphilippe there, Mollema, Sagan, Van Avermaet, Moscon, Uran, Ulisse, Bardet. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to ride. When you've got the world champion here, you don't want to take him to the finish. You want to try and attack him. And Sagan knows this, and it's, it's going to be very difficult. I think they're going to get caught from behind. You can just see Orica Bike Exchange getting involved with the chase. This is going to come back. Whether they bring back uh, Rui Costa, they might, they might stall a little bit and look around. But uh, this is a huge effort from Rui Costa. It's going to be very difficult to hold them off in the last six kilometres, but he's making a good fist of it. It is. He certainly is making a fantastic effort here he's got about 10 seconds maybe just a little bit more the group chasing behind it's being led by the blue and green the new livery of course of orica bike exchange they change their kit halfway through the year they are driving hard they have michael matthews amongst their number but as you said earlier on brian lamplay marida have played a, almost a perfect race so far still 5.9 k's to go and the bunch has caught this group now. Peter Sagan glances over his shoulder on the front of the bunch there. Rigoberto around there. Gianni Moscon off Team Sky, the young Italian. He's had a superb race, but the mass troops now of Orica Bike Exchange hit the front. And I think it is Michael Albacini. Counter-attack now from the Olympic champion, Greg Van Avermaet. 
Yeah, if they keep uh, riding, then they'll bring uh, Ray Costa back. And, uh, you know, Greg Van Havermaet, the Olympic champion, in his gold bike, wants to push on. But there is some numbers behind. And this is a huge ride by uh, Durbridge now, coming up uh, to bring uh, Van Avermaet back. No wonder they call him Turbo Durbo. Look at that on the front. Such a valuable asset. So much firepower. And meanwhile, up in front, Rui Costa still got a good lead. Luke Durbridge swings off the front. His job for the day is done. Can Rui Costa hold them off? This is the short and steep climb of the Côte de Polytechnique. 780 metres long, 6% average graded. But remember, there's a 200 metre stretch at 11%. Brutally steep, so deep in the race. Still, Greg Van Avermaet perseveres on the front. Opens a slight gap. Alaphilippe in second. Gianni Moscon in third. No, it actually looks like it's Bakoc actually in second. Alaphilippe in fourth. Moscon there. And meanwhile, the other rider that's also there looking very dangerous indeed is the world champion Peter Sagan. Duchesne, the local rider, is done for the day for Direct Energy. That's why our Canadian hosts are lingering on that particular rider. A few Canadians in this race. But meanwhile, Diego, sorry, Rui Costa is over the top of that climb. And now it's essentially dropping all the way apart from that last little kick up to the line but brian i oh, think it's getting close. the gap is narrowed too much now yeah it's getting very close now uh, but there's no cohesion and uh does look as if uh, ethics i've got two riders uh, trying to do something but at the end of the day you can just see behind that um at least he's just following uh, peter sagan there is a possibility of maybe two three four riders going across to Rui costa but he just he's committed now uh, you look behind there and you can see these four riders, but they're only just in front of the peloton. I'm f I'm afraid that it's going to be touch and go whether it really costs. It was a brilliant attack, but I'm not too sure he'll be able to uh, to hang on now. Well, I think it's interesting that Etics have two riders there. It looks like his, it is the uh, the rider Peter Vakoc, who was ninth the other day, and Alaphilippe. And I think by the look of uh, the way Vakoc is riding, now with Etics having a couple of riders here, they have to commit to the chase. And I think that Vakoc will sacrifice himself for Julian Alaphilippe. But is Vakoc on the front, but the bunch are not too far behind. Vakoc drills it on the front. Alaphilippe now goes to the front as well. Rigoberto Oran of Cannondale Drapak on his wheel. Still the young rider from Italy is there as well. Gianni Moscon and Diego Ulissi drifts on the back this is fascinating racing but look who's made it across van avermaet came across there with uh, peter sagan they're not going anywhere without uh, each other so it's whether they uh, they keep on riding 100 percent if they do then Rui costa has been brought back or lacy getting a free ride at the back well just behind them again the peloton are coming up from behind well, Vakoc now rolls through on the front. Peter Sagan, the world road champion, on his wheel. Greg Van Avermaet, the Olympic champion, on his wheel. Gianni Moscon in the blue of in the blue and black of Team Sky, also there in this group. It looked like they were caught at one point. They were. And then they've, then they've, <laughs> got, then they've gone away again. The same group has gone clear again. Alaphilippe just sits towards the back of this group there. Looks like a rider from Dimension Data. It looks like it might be Nathan Haas actually trying to come across this gap. The muscular figure of the Australian. But up in front with just on four kilometers to go is Rui Costa of Portugal and Lampre Merida. He's still got a little bit of a gap, but look at who's trying to close things down. It's the world champion, Peter Sagan. Yeah, you don't want to look behind, and he is doing the uh, lion's share of the work, and uh, Van Avermaet has uh, tried a few times as well. He'll come through, do his turn, and swing over. It's still in the balance, uh, at least they're getting an easy ride, and you're right, just behind a couple of riders trying to come across, one of them uh, from uh, IAM and the other from uh, Team Dimension Data. It looks like he was Fumo, the Swiss champion. Looks like they've been a little bit gassed. There's only a, I don't know, 30, 30 meters or so. Vakoc looks over, he gets assistance from Gianni Moscon. He's had a fantastic debut season, has the young Italian. The thing is, Oran's doing absolutely nothing in this front group as well, and he's very capable of uh, doing what he did the other day and, and possibly pulling it off this time. We're into the closing three kilometers of the Grand Prix Cycliste de Montreal, and what a race it is. We had a thriller in Quebec on Friday where the winner was Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan is in this group behind. The race leader gritting his teeth with pain is Rui Costa of Portugal and Lampre Morida. It looks as if he is about to be caught, but he still has a tenuous lead. And just behind the group being led by Vakoc of the Czech Republic and Etix Quickstep is the bunch. Peter Sagan now leads this group. 
Rigoberto Aram, the winner of the GP Quebec in 2015, is also there. This is going to come right down to the wire, Brian. Thrilling scenes here in Quebec. Yeah, so we'll get Rui Costa on, on his own. And then we'll get the small group of his Sagan. But just behind, the winner could actually come from the uh, the main group, just sitting behind him. It could all come back together. It's going to be a nail-biting finish. It certainly is. Rui Costa still, still has that tenuous lead. Three or four seconds. Rigoberto Oran for Cannondale Drapak now takes the front. Movistar now taking over. That's Jean Izaguirre, the Spaniard. We've only got 2.2 kilometers to go. Can he hold on? Remember, we dropped down the uh, Avenue du Parc, then that U-turn before the kick up to the line into a nasty headwind. And Rui Costa is only just on the front. This is agonizingly close now. The bunch are just behind being led by FDJ. Absolutely fascinating, thrilling scenes here in Montreal. This is going to come down to the last 1,500 meters. You can also see Navardowskos is up there as well for... Um the uh, group behind but if these combine well together then they can stay away because from said that you're chasing but they're not closing it's just holding out there but i'm afraid for um ray costa i don't think it's going to be his day today it isn't he's been out too far in front and the rider leading the chase just a couple of meters behind him now is the world champion and the winner of the gp quebec just a couple of days ago here is the shot rui costa is the man on the front still holding on to the slenderest of leads coming into the last few hundred meters of this race it's rui costa of lamprey and portugal who rounds the final corner on his own he has 10 meters over the world road champion, Peter Sagan, on his wheel is Jan Izaguirre. Then it is the Olympic champion. There's a oh. crash, it looks like Vakoc has gone down. Awful there for Petr Vakoc, the Czech rider. And meanwhile, Rui Costa is still in front, Brian. And just on his wheel now is Peter Sagan, the world champion, who is going to run out the winner of the GP Cyclist de Montreal. Rui Costa digs again. Rigoberto Aram goes for Canada. It's not Rigoberto Aram. It's a big launch there by one of the riders from Cannondale. Peter Sagan is on his wheel now. Peter Sagan with Greg Van Avermaet on his wheel. Diego Ulissi is also there for Lamprey, the Italian on the left-hand side. Looks like it was actually Ravradowskis, but now Ulissi in the center of your screen and on the left-hand side is Peter Sagan on the wheel of the Olympic road champion. It is Greg Van Avermaet in the center of your screen. Van Avermaet takes the win for BMC. Second on Friday, first today, Greg Van Avermaet of BMC and Belgium takes the win in a ridiculously exciting Grand Prix Cycles de Montreal. Well, Brian, <laughs> I'm worn out, you're worn out. What a race that was. Breathtaking, it all pretty much came together in the, uh, the last uh, corner there. Unfortunately for Vakoc, he, he slid out, but uh, reverse of the results uh, on Friday, where uh, the Olympic champion takes out a very uh, strong victory there. Peter Sagan was, having to, uh, was left to do a lot of work there, but he played this very canny, quality bike rider, kept his calm towards the end, and um, won the race today in Montreal. Second uh, was uh, the world champion Sagan, and I think Oluisi was up there. Nice to see, I think it was uh, Nathan Haas up there in fifth place. So here we see it again, and I think it was Betio that hit out for uh, for Cannondale, but this was a strong, strong sprint by uh, Van Avermaet. He takes the race. Oluisi hangs on to third place. There was another rider, I think, uh, to the left-hand side, but did look as if Nathan Haas takes a, a fine fifth place. I think it was uh, Ala Philippe at this moment, but uh, Betty all strikes out. Uh, Alice now at the front, but um, first and second from uh, Quebec with uh, Van Avermaet in the front. You know, you can see from this point of view when uh, Sagan sat, sat down, it was all over, and uh, has to settle for second. Well, punch in the air with delight on his golden bike, his first win as Olympic champion, Greg Van Avermaet of BMC. Matthews? We're gonna take a quick commercial break before we come back for the podium. <laughs> 